Howdy, it's Kyle talking about Michigan. In this video, I'll be going over various aspects of the geography of the state. I'll be talking about the cities and the urban landscape. I'll be going over the physical geography to include the scenery, national parks, lakes, and climate. I'll be discussing various economic indicators to include the companies that are headquartered there, industries that drive the economy, tax rates, and agriculture. And I'll also be going over some of the cultural aspects of the state to include the music and food. So if you're interested in learning more about the Great Lakes State, this is the video for you. Michigan sits in the upper Midwest and has a shoreline with four of the five Great Lakes. The population is right about 10 million people, which ranks at 10th in the country and is growing fairly slowly. It ranks 22nd in the U.S. in terms of land area, but if you include water area, it's the 11th largest state in the country and it has the 9th largest coastline of all states in the U.S. The state is divided between the Upper Peninsula, which is usually referred to as the UP, and the Lower Peninsula, which I really never heard anybody refer to as the LP. People from the UP are often referred to as Upers, and people from the Lower Peninsula are often referred to as Trolls because they live below the bridge that connects the two peninsulas. Because the Lower Peninsula is shaped kind of like a mitten, oftentimes folks in small towns will indicate where they're from by pointing to somewhere on their hand like a small town right there, and the part of the peninsula that's right here is literally referred to as the thumb. The total population of the UP is about 300,000 people, so it's only 3% of the state, so 97% of the population of Michigan lives in the Lower Peninsula. There are 83 counties in the state, and the counties are shaped kind of square. Of those 83, 51 are losing population, including all of the counties in the UP. And there's definitely geographic population differentiation with most of the western half of the Lower Peninsula gaining population along with the Detroit suburbs in the southeastern portion of the state, but the rest of the state is losing population. Michigan was admitted to the Union in 1837 as the 26th state, but prior to that in 1835 and 36 was what was called the Toledo War. It wasn't really a war, it was more of a war of words. Prior to statehood, both Michigan and Ohio claimed an area called the Toledo Strip, which included the town of Toledo and the port on Lake Erie. Ohio was already a state, so Michigan surrendered claims to the Toledo Strip and the Lake Erie port. In return, the federal government granted them portions of the UP from what was the Wisconsin Territory. The capital city is Lansing, which has a population of about 118,000 people, and the metro area has about 500,000, making it the third largest metro in the state. There's a 26% poverty rate, and the median house value is $86,000. But it isn't all bad there. There's a part of town called Old Town, which is your cool, hip, and funky neighborhood with your boutique shops and restaurants, some good bars and nightlife. Not too far from there is a part of town called REO Town, which is your gentrified former industrial area. There's also a nice spot called the Lansing River Trail. This is about 17 miles of walking and biking trails, or you can paddle in the river right there. Directly adjacent to Lansing is the city of East Lansing, which is a completely different jurisdiction, and this is home to Michigan State University. The largest city in the state is Detroit, with a population of about 670,000 people, making it the 24th largest city in the U.S. The population is declining, and it's lost 30% of its population since 2000. In fact, it's been losing population for 70 years. The population peaked in 1950 at about 1.8 million, when it was the 5th largest city in the U.S. However, the rate of population decline did decrease in the 2010s, and I predict at 2030 that will be the first census since 1950 where the city actually gains population. Even though the population of the city has declined a lot, the suburban counties have grown in population. The overall metro area has a population of about 4.6 million, which ranks at 14th in the U.S. The economic woes of the city are pretty well documented. The median house value there is $50,000 and there's a 35% poverty rate and the crime rate is pretty high throughout much of the city. My best friend lives in the suburbs there and I've been visiting up there about once a year for the past 20 years and for the longest time up until the past few years ago there really wasn't that much improvements but there have been some improvements in the most recent years. I think one thing that has helped a lot in the past few years is the new arena right downtown. Prior to that, most of the major concerts and events were way out in the suburbs in an arena where the NBA Detroit Pistons played at. But now all that stuff is right downtown, so 
between all the major sports teams and all the concerts and events, pretty much every day of the year there's an event going on in downtown Detroit that draws at least 10,000 people. I think one thing that has hurt downtown a lot is that the main entertainment district for the city is called Greektown. And it really isn't that big of a deal. There aren't that many great restaurants and bars there kind of stuff. And the main nightlife entertainment district for the metro area is in a suburb called Royal Oak. So all that money is being spent out in the suburbs and not downtown. But just like many or even most other cities in the U.S., there's been quite a bit of gentrification to occur in areas that had a lot of blight previously. One of these gentrified neighborhoods is called Corktown, which is located just southwest of downtown. And this is the oldest residential neighborhood in the city, and now it's gotten pretty pricey in recent years. Adjacent to that is an area called Mexican Town, which has not been gentrified quite yet. It's pretty rough around the edges a little bit, but a lot of great restaurants there. But the main part of town to see gentrification is called Midtown. This is the part of town between downtown and the campus of Wayne State University. So just in the past few years, there have been a lot of different kind of shops and restaurants, a lot of local kind of places, a lot of startups kind of stuff, and got kind of a hip, funky feel to it. And this area was very blighted before all this recent gentrification. And there's been a lot of new construction going on in this part of town as well. There was a lot of demolition of some of the blighted homes, and it's been replaced by newer homes and apartments and condos. But of course, these cost way more than what the stuff cost there before. And so even though a lot of the poorer population of Detroit has not benefited from the gentrification, they weren't benefiting from the non-gentrification before all that happened either. But I think what's hurt Detroit the most is that some of the most important things that are in most other big cities for Detroit, they're in the suburbs. So for example, just east of town, there's an area called the Gross Points. These are several small towns that are all very expensive and very wealthy. Most cities, this would be a part of the main city itself. And like I mentioned before, Royal Oak is a suburb that has most of the main entertainment and nightlife stuff. Ford Motor Company is headquartered in the suburb of Dearborn. And again, prior to the new arena, so many of the major concerts and events and NBA games were way out in the suburbs. There isn't any other city in the country where so much important stuff is only in the suburbs, but not in the main city. But that is changing a little bit. Things are improving a little bit. And there's actually a couple of new skyscrapers going up. So that's really going to change the skyline of the city with these new high rises going up. And it's also going to be a new bridge that connects it to Windsor, Canada. That will make a big difference as well in terms of the overall skyline and overall feel of downtown. At the western end of Detroit Metro is the city of Ann Arbor, which is the college town for the University of Michigan. And because the university is so huge, the college town itself is pretty big. But Ann Arbor is a little bit wealthier, a little bit more expensive than the rest of the metro area, and it's also growing at a larger rate than the rest of the metro area. And one thing kind of annoying about Detroit and much of the rest of the state is what's called the Michigan Left Turn. In every other state in the country, as well as any country in the world that drives on the right side of the road to make a left turn, when you get to the intersection, you make a left turn. But in Michigan, you have to make a right turn, go a block away, then go up to another stoplight where you have to wait to make a U-turn. And then you make a U-turn. Now you're finally going in the direction you want to go, but then you have to stop at the stoplight in the intersection you were at previously. So instead of going through one intersection with one stoplight, you get to go through three intersections with three stoplights. It's brilliant. The second largest city in the state is Grand Rapids, located in the southwestern portion of the Lower Peninsula. It has a population of just over 200,000, and the metro area has a little over 1 million, ranking it the 53rd largest metro in the U.S. And unlike the rest of Michigan, this area is growing a lot. There's been a lot of population growth in recent years, and it's one of the hot spots to move to in the Midwest. And there are two main reasons for this. One is it was the only major metro in the state that wasn't heavily dependent on the auto industry. So when the automotive industry declined a little bit, it didn't hurt Grand Rapids as much as it did the rest of the state. And the other thing that really helped the city is that a couple of philanthropists donated millions of dollars to help kickstart the medical high-tech sector. And I probably sound like a broken record at times through some of my videos, but if you want to make it in the 21st century, you have to go high-tech, or in Grand Rapids' case, high-tech medical. The largest part of that is the Van Andel Institute, which is part of what's called the Medical Mile, where there's a lot of major medical companies headquartered there. And because of all this, the Michigan State University Medical School moved from Lansing to Grand Rapids. It's one of the fastest growing economies in the U.S. with an average household income, median house value, and crime, but a below average cost of living. 
The city has two nicknames. One is Furniture City because there's a lot of major furniture manufacturers located right there in town. And the other is Beer City USA because there are more breweries per capita there than anywhere else in the U.S. There are over 80 breweries in the Grand Rapids metro area. The main part of town for the fun stuff is called Uptown. This is your hip and funky neighborhood with your boutique shops, your restaurants, bars, art galleries, and good nightlife. A lot of folks are moving there from different parts of Michigan, but they're also moving there from different parts of the country. You don't hear about it too much, but it is a pretty cool spot. Check it out. The next largest metro in the state is Flint. The city has about 95,000 people, and the county has about 400,000. Flint is well known for being an economically depressed city. The per capita income is only $17,000, and 39% of the population live in poverty. The median house value is an astonishing $27,000. This is largely due to the fact that many homes there have virtually no value or might be worth legally $1. And to go along with all that, it has a very high rate of crime as well. The city has gone through two major negative events through the years. One is that General Motors was founded there in 1908, but they moved to Detroit and moved over 90% of the jobs with it. And the second major negative was back in 2014 when the city switched from using Lake Huron to the Flint River for its water. However, the infrastructure was not up to it, and the result was that the water was contaminated with lead, and that led to a lot of lead poisoning. And that has just recently started to have been improved. So the city was already losing population, but the water situation just made it worse. But it isn't all entirely bad. There are some nice outdoor areas. There's the Flint River Water Trail, which is about 73 miles throughout the county, and the Flint River Hiking Trail is about 17 miles. So if you're looking to escape some of the urban blights, well, there's at least that. Muskegon is a city about 45 minutes northwest of Grand Rapids, right along the shores of Lake Michigan. There are about 38,000 people in the city and about 175,000 in the county. It's a nice enough little city with a good lakeside area with shopping and restaurants. There's a boat launch there and some biking and walking trails nearby. It's also home to a few large ship museums, including the USS LST-393, the USS Silversides World War II submarine, and the SS Milwaukee Clipper, which is a Great Lakes cruise ship. Another small city is Kalamazoo. It's located in the southwestern portion of the Lower Peninsula. There are about 75,000 people in the city and about 270,000 in the county. It's home to the Kalamazoo Mall, which is the first outdoor pedestrian mall in the U.S., and it's got some shops and restaurants, cafes, and breweries there. But the coolest part about Kalamazoo is the Air Zoo. It's a museum with about 50 historic aircraft. There's a 3D motion flight simulator, and it has a mission theater that moves around kind of like the Star Tours ride at Disneyland. Not too far from Kalamazoo is the town of Battle Creek, which has about 50,000 people and about 134,000 in the county. Its nickname is Cereal City. It's the corporate headquarters of Kellogg's. However, they don't actually make cereal there anymore. I remember my wife and I were there about 15 years ago, and she was like, wow, this is the best smelling town in America because of the cereal factory, but the cereal is no longer made there. But it is home to what are called the cargo shops. This is a business area where small businesses can rent these old shipping containers and they use them as their business stalls. A really cool idea. Heading north along the shores of Lake Huron is a town of Saginaw and the Tri-Cities area of Saginaw, Bay City, and Midland. And this is referred to as the Great Lakes Bay region. Saginaw is the largest of the three with about 45,000 people and about 190,000 in the county. This went about a 21% population decline there since 2000. And this is largely due to the fact of General Motors closing down many parts plants. I believe there used to be six different parts plants for GM, and now only one is left. And this led to the city being very economically depressed. The median house value is only $58,000, and there's a very high crime rate as well. The other cities in the Tri-Cities area are Bay City and Midland, and these are each a little bit nicer than Saginaw, but because so many of the folks that worked in those plants in Saginaw lived in Bay City or Midland, when those plants closed down, it hurt Bay City and Midland as well. But Bay City does have a nice little downtown right along the bay itself, and it isn't anywhere near as bad as Saginaw. In the northwestern portion of the Lower Peninsula is one of my favorite small towns in the country, and that's Traverse City. It's right along Grand Traverse Bay of Lake Michigan. 
The population is only about 16,000, but there's a really nice downtown. It's great for walking around, a nice waterfront. It's heavily dependent on tourism, and it's also the center of Michigan's cherry industry. In the eastern portion of the UP is the town of Sault Ste. Marie, which is right along the Canadian border with Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. There are about 13,000 people that live in the town and 35,000 in the county. It sits right along the river that connects Lake Superior and Lake Huron, and there's also an area called the Sioux Locks, which is what ships will use to avoid some of the rapids along the river. And it's a pretty popular spot for tourists from other parts of Michigan. So I certainly can't mention all the towns in the state, but I did want to go over some of the most important ones. Next, I want to get into some of the physical geography of Michigan. It's a very pretty state, and most of the non-urban portions of the state are wooded, especially the UP, which is almost entirely wooded. There are several sites within the state that are part of the National Park Service, and a lot of great state parks as well. The most defining feature of Michigan's physical geography are the Great Lakes. Lake Superior, just north of the UP, is the second largest lake in the world and the largest freshwater lake in the world. Lake Huron to the east is the fourth largest lake in the world, and Lake Michigan to the west is the fifth largest lake in the world. And Michigan has a shoreline with the western end of Lake Erie, which is the 11th largest lake in the world. And then you've got poor old Lake St. Clair, which is overshadowed by the Great Lakes, but it's still the 15th largest lake in the U.S. So it's possible for goods manufactured in Chicago or Milwaukee to be exported by following the Great Lakes. These giant ocean-going ships can go up Lake Michigan, then over to Lake Huron, down through Lake St. Clair into Lake Erie, then around Niagara Falls to Lake Ontario, then the St. Lawrence River all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. And water in general just plays a huge role in terms of the physical geography of the state. There are several national park sites in the state that are either along the shore of one of the Great Lakes or an island in one of them. The national park that is an island is Isle Royal National Park in the western portion of Lake Superior. The entire island is a national park and it's actually closer to Minnesota than Michigan. It's one of the least visited national parks in the country because it's kind of hard to get to. You have to get there by either a ferry from the UP or from the eastern portion of Minnesota. Or you can fly in a little tiny plane about the size of a crop duster. Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore is right along the shores of Lake Superior in the northern portion of the UP. It's known for having some high cliffs going right up against the shore, and it's a really beautiful sight. If you were to just see photos of this park and not know where it is, you probably wouldn't guess Michigan first. So you can paddle around in a kayak or take a boat ride at the bottom, or you can hike along the rim at the top. It's kind of an underappreciated gem, but something that's definitely worth checking out. Along the western shore of the lower peninsula is Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore. And these are huge dunes that go right up against the leeward shore of Lake Michigan. So you can kind of sled or roll down to the bottom of it and then realize how difficult it is to get back up at the top. You'll be huffing and puffing by the time you get back up there. And it's a popular spot for folks to go to and kind of play in the dunes, especially if you have kids. But when you're talking about the scenic beauty of Michigan, you're mostly going to be talking about the UP. A lot of the peninsula is the Hiawatha National Forest, which is heavily wooded and pretty remote for the most part. There are a lot of great spots for camping and hiking all throughout the National Forest, and it's some of the closest thing you're going to get to true wilderness in the eastern half of the U.S. Mount Arvin is the highest point in the state at 1,979 feet, or 603 meters. It's located in the Huron Mountains not far from the shore of Lake Superior. Toward the eastern end of the UP is Tequamanon Falls State Park, which is home to the second largest waterfall in the eastern U.S. in terms of volume. The lower peninsula isn't as gorgeous as the UP, but it does have some pretty nice spots as well. Most of it is kind of flat or rolling hills, but strangely enough, there are several towns there that have the word mount in it. In terms of climate, in the spring, the temperatures are usually pretty nice, but it also gets a lot of rain during that time of year. Temperature-wise, the summers are beautiful, but if you're near one of the lakes, in June and July, you get a lot of black flies and fish flies. And some of those nights in June and July near the lakes, you'll have a screen door just covered in a sheet of fish flies. Obviously, with it being so far north, it gets really cold during the winter, but it also gets very snowy, especially in the UP. And the UP is one of the snowiest areas in the whole contiguous U.S. Syracuse, New York is the snowiest city in the U.S., averaging about 124 inches of snow per year. However, the town of Houghton, Michigan in the UP averages 207 inches of snow per year. 
and much of the UP in general gets well over 100 inches of snow per year. But the reason why you get so much snow in the UP is the same reason why you get so much snow in upstate New York, and that's the lake effect. So anywhere on the eastern end of the Great Lakes, which is downwind of it, is going to have a ton of snow during the winter. So if you're into water activities in the spring, summer, or fall, like boating, paddling, or fishing, or snow activities in the winter, like snowmobiling, snowshoeing, or ice fishing, it doesn't get much better than Michigan. Now I want to discuss the economy of the state, and the economy of Michigan has been intimately tied to the automotive industry for well over a hundred years, so when things are going good in autos, they're going good for the economy of the state, but unfortunately, more often than not, over the past 40-50 years, it's been kind of negative. So back during the 90s and the early 2000s, Michigan's economy was hurting more than just about any other state because of the state of the automotive industry. And now that things are a little bit more diversified in the state, the economy is improving a little bit because it isn't relying entirely on the automotive industry. You've probably heard the term the big three to refer to Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler. However, that term really needs to be retired as Chrysler is no longer an American company. It's owned by Fiat, which is Italian. In terms of the overall economy of the state, Michigan ranks 14th in the U.S. in terms of GDP at about $525 billion per year. It ranks 37th in terms of GDP per capita at about $54,000 per year, and it ranks 32nd in household income at about $57,000 per year. There are many companies that are headquartered in the state that are part of the automotive industry that aren't Ford or GM. These include Lear, which does automotive seats and electronics, Federal Mogul, which has automotive, aerospace, and marine products. Cooper Standard, which has auto parts, including sealing, fluid and brake lines and hoses. Borg Warner Automotive Transmissions and Turbochargers. Penske Automotive. And Next Deer Steering and Driveline Components. But not everything in the state is automotive. Some of the biggest non-automotive companies headquartered in the state include Whirlpool Appliances, Kellogg Cereal, Conway Freight and Logistics, Domino's Pizza, Altair AI and Computer Simulations, Amway Health and Home Care Products, Quicken Loans, Dow Chemical, Little Caesars. And as I alluded to before with Grand Rapids being Furniture City, it's home to Herman Miller Office Furniture, Steelcase Office Furniture, and Lazy Boy Furniture is also in the state, but not in Grand Rapids. But one of the big high-tech medical companies that is in Grand Rapids is called Stryker Medical Implants, which does joint replacements and all kinds of other high-tech medical products. And stuff like that is why Grand Rapids is doing better than the rest of the state. And although Michigan is most definitely known for automotive and other manufacturing, it's not quite as well known as how important Michigan is in terms of agriculture. The state ranks first in terms of black beans, red beans, and the second for overall dry beans, it's first in potatoes that are used for potato chips, first in asparagus, first in pickles, and third in overall fresh cucumbers, first in squash, and first in all non-soybean legumes. It ranks second in celery, third in blueberries, third in Christmas trees, third in apples, fourth in carrots, fourth in sugar beets, fourth in cherries, fifth in tomatoes, and it's sixth in terms of overall milk production. So that's a very impressive list of crops in which Michigan is a very important player for the country. It also ranks 8th in overall mining in the U.S. and is one of the most important states for iron ore mining. However, the mining industry is becoming less and less important through the years. And that's one of the reasons why the U.P., especially the western portion of the U.P., has seen population decline recently. In terms of taxes, there's a flat 4.25% state income tax, which is below average. It has the 13th lowest sales tax at 6%, but it has the 8th highest property tax at 1.8%. So you take a below average income tax, well below average sales tax, and even though it's pretty high property tax, the overall tax burden is below average for Michigan. But when you combine that with the fact that Michigan has decent wages and below average housing costs, the overall cost of living for the state is below average. Next, I want to discuss some of the unique cultural aspects of the state, and there are plenty of things about the culture of Michigan that make it stand out from the rest of the states, but if you're going to talk about the culture of Michigan, you have to start with the music. Detroit's nickname is the Motor City or Motown, and Motown Records was established in Detroit. Some of the biggest names in R&B and soul in the 60s and 70s originated from Detroit. These include Mary Wells, 
the Four Tops, Diana Ross and the Supremes, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, The Temptations, Jackie Wilson, Aretha Franklin, Stevie Wonder, and The Spinners. But Michigan is also home to many major acts in terms of classic rock, including Mitch Ryder, Alice Cooper, Grand Funk Railroad, Bob Seger, Ted Nugent, MC5, Iggy Pop, Xuji Quattro, and Glenn Fry. But it isn't just really old music either. In the past 20 years or so, many more major acts have emerged from Michigan. These include Aaliyah, Eminem, Insane Clown Posse, Kid Rock, Jack White, and my personal favorite current rapper, Danny Brown. So Michigan has been and continues to be one of the most important players in American music. Now I want to discuss some of the signature foods that come out of Michigan. Detroit is well known for all of its Coney dog places and there's a unique take on these dogs which includes a lot of raw onions on them. Most people are aware of Lafayette and American Coney's but there are so many other smaller ones all throughout the metro area and they're usually pretty good. And one thing ironic about that is that hot dogs in Detroit are called Coney's and hot dogs in upstate New York are called Michigan's. Also from Detroit is their unique take on deep dish pizza. And what makes it different is the fact that it's square. And it's not just the shape itself, but when it is square, the corners become all crusty and crunchy. I really like it that way. Something else you'll find in different parts of the state is German fried chicken. And it's not deep fried, so the skin is thin and flaky, so it isn't the same as the thick and crunchy skin you get in fried chicken down south. In the UP, you can find something called pasties. And these are pastry shells stuffed with meat, carrots, and potatoes. Michigan is also home to Verner's Ginger Ale, and I really like ginger ale, and Verner's has a real bite to it. And you can't discuss Michigan without bringing up Fago. And this stuff comes in all different types of flavors, and every time I go up there, I bring back a bunch of two liters of something called Rock and Rye. So there's no shortage of great signature foods and drinks that come out of Michigan, but they're all pretty unhealthy. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give me a thumbs up to let me know you approve and subscribe to this channel if you're interested in learning more about U.S. geography. I'm comparing and contrasting all kinds of cities and states and all kinds of different categories, talking about cross-country road tripping. Everything I do is from a little more nerdy type perspective. But yeah, thanks for watching. Geography King, signing out.